Bonjour, bon après-midi, madame et monsieur, et bienvenue. And I promise that is the last of my dreadful schoolboy French that you'll get to hear today. Uh, my name is Jonathan Cowup, and I'm one of the presenters at BBC Radio York, and it's my great pleasure to be your host for this afternoon's session. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the York Festival of Ideas 2021, as we celebrate 10 years of educating, entertaining and inspiring. This is one of two events presented in collaboration with the French Embassy in the UK, exploring important contemporary issues facing the world today. Before we begin, can I just draw your attention to a few technical notes? If you're watching this live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button that you will find at the bottom of your screen, I think. This is available throughout the event, so questions can be asked at any time you like. Should you have any technical issues, such as the loss of Wi-Fi, for example, you can rejoin the event using the original link that you use to connect with us. Please remember also that today's event is being recorded, so you will be able to watch it again. Subtitles are available in this event. To turn these on or off, use the CC Live Transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Now then, down to business, and it is my great pleasure to welcome the first of our speakers today, yes. Ambassador Olivier Poivre de Davoir. Davoir, my apologies, a diplomat, a perfect English speaker, cultural official, maritime specialist and author. In 2005, he was founder and president of the Marathon des Mots, one of the biggest international literature festivals in France and Europe. He spent five years as the director of Radio France Culture. He was appointed ambassador for the Poles and maritime issues in December of 2020. He's a specialist in maritime and environmental issues. He's been president of the National Navy Museum since 2014 and founded the Saison Bleu, an association promoting a sustainable blue economy, particularly in the Mediterranean region. <laughs> Welcome, Ambassador, and over to you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, I really would like to thank the festival team and, and the French Embassy's Science Division for giving me the opportunity to take part in this one line event. So happy 10th uh, anniversary to all of you. This is highly, highly appreciated, although I, I would honestly have preferred the possibility to visit England in person again. But having lived in your country quite a few years ago when visited York several times, especially your so famous university. I'm therefore very happy to be even virtually with you on this sunny Sunday. York is probably not watches as much as Carbis Bay in this afternoon and your festival not part of the G7, but it's about ideas and oceans. And for me, as French ambassador for ports and maritime issues, that's all I care about. So thank you again. As an introduction to our debates and to other speakers' presentations, I would like to briefly address two very basic questions. First, why the oceans must be protected? And second, what can and must be done? In fact, we have all the good reasons to care about the oceans. Preserving the oceans is actually a kind of joint task for all of us, not only scientists and experts, but also governments and citizens together. And one should make clear that protecting the oceans means much more than preserving sea landscapes and sailing venues. It's about maintaining healthy ecosystems, preventing or healing the pollution of marine environment, safeguarding food chains. Such endeavors actually start very far from the deep seas. It starts in our households, in our industrial or agricultural production facilities with the quality of waste water getting out of them. So why should we worry about the impact of our way of life on the oceans? One first rationale is preserving biodiversity. If biodiversity collapses, we will never be able to fulfill most of the Millennium Development Goals, 
including those relating to human and economic development. It is a well-known fact that we have to act now, not tomorrow, now, in a collective and determined manner to prevent the deterioration of our planet's main biotope and environment. Yet, that environment is primarily made of water, the oceans. And at this stage, I would like to welcome the very recent decision by the American National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to officially recognize, to us time, the Southern Ocean as our planet's fifth ocean, the only one to surround the continent, Antarctica, instead of being surrounded by lands. In my country, France, our government is actively committed to assuming its responsibilities and playing its part to protect biodiversity. Our Minister for Ecological Transition, our Minister for Marine Affairs, and also the one of State for Biodiversity are jointly implementing France's national strategy for marine protected areas. By 2022, next year, this strategy aims to cover at least 30% of the national land territory and marine waters under jurisdictions or sovereignty with protected areas and 10% under high-level protection, including vast areas in the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Indian Oceans. In the Southern Ocean, France and Australia have introduced with an ever-growing number of co-sponsors and supporters the proposal to establish a protected marine area in Eastern Antarctica. Together with the existing PMA in the Royal Sea and the proposed ones in the Vedel Sea and around the Antarctic Peninsula, we could all benefit from a series of reserves and repositories around the Antarctic. This is an opportunity not to be missed if we are serious about current global challenges and our legacy to the next generation. Our hope is that the international community in the 21st century to remain able to act collectively in the interest of the whole planet. Agreeing without further delay to expand of our network of protected marine areas will be an excellent step forward. And I know your country, UK, as well as United States, thanks to President Biden and his special envoy for the climate, John Kerry, I've joined the coalition where only two countries are missing, but not small countries. I am speaking about Russia and China. As a diplomat, I will do my best to convince them, but it's an hard job, I can tell you. But another very good reason to care about the oceans is the topic of the event you have so rightly organized in York today. It's about climate. The ocean plays a central role, as you know, in climate control, while being adversely affected by climate change. Both a solution and a victim of climate change, the ocean requires to be preserved. The ocean lies at the heart of the climate system. It plays a critical role in the fight against climate change by absorbing almost a third of the CO2 produced by human activities, while also being severely impacted by its effect. As such, an effective response to global climate change must integrate both an increased protection of the ocean and the use of the solution it can provide us with. This is an integral part of the Ad Agenda 2030 with one of the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGE 14, devoted to oceans. Science has highlighted the urgency to act. The rise of the sea level is accelerating due to the melting of glaciers and the Arctic ice pack, as you know. The rise recorded over the past century has already averaged 12 to 21st, 21 centimeters. If nothing is done, it could reach more than one meter on average by 2100. Extreme events, such as storms, cyclones, are also most frequent. 
Without major investments in adaptation, coastal cities will be exposed to increasing risk of flooding, which could eventually lead to major human displacements. The acidity of the oceans resulting from this absorption of CO2 has increased by 30% in the two and a half century, 30%, directly threatening marine species. In this sense, the ocean is located at the interface between climate and biodiversity, as evidenced by certain coastal ecosystems, I mean mangroves, seagrass bed in particular, which participate in mitigation, absorb CO2, and adaptation protect the coast erosion to climate change while constituting important reservoir of biodiversity. In addition, the ocean stores 93% of the excess energy, heat, caused by human activities, which increases the temperature of the water and, in so doing, contributes to the rise in sea level. However, the storage capacities of the oceans are reaching their limit, which means rethinking ocean-based practice and solutions. So what can we do? How can we act? As I said, both citizens and governments must work actively to achieve these objectives. But since you invite me as a representative of the French government, I will limit my own observation to what governments are doing and illustrate them with the commitments by France and its partner. In 2015, France supported the inclusion of oceans in the preamble of the Paris Agreement and the request for a special intergovernmental panel on climate change, IPCC, report on the ocean and cryosphere. It's also signed the two because the oceans declarations to promote better inclusion in, of the ocean into climate strategies. This is a clear scientific consensus on climate change of anthropogenic origin, the effect of which our lives are already visible and will soon be even more so. To address this challenge, all countries adopted this Paris Agreement on Climate at COP21 in 2015, six years ago. The Paris Agreement is a universal treaty establishing a new multilateral framework for fighting climate change, and that is applied under the UN framework, Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, it opens the way for gradual enhancement of mitigation and adaptation commitments by all countries, including through cooperation mechanism concerning finance, technology transfers, and capacity building. Now that it is in force and most of its implementing rules have been adopted, the Paris Agreement needs to be fully implemented. In this context, the next stage in international efforts will take place in your country at COP26 to be held in Glasgow in November. COP26 is expected to take the ocean climate nexus even further. Given the start of what it still opt to be the super year for ocean climate and biodiversity, raising ocean ambition is central for the UK COP26 presidency. International cooperation and support are very essential for this ambition. To that end, our countries recall their support to the UN decade of ocean science to make the best available science at the heart of discussions. France is also supports the strengthening of links between the UNFCCC and other fora dealing with the oceans under the aegis of the United Nations, in particular the Convention on Biological Diversity and the International Marine um, Maritime sorry, Organization, where it is promoting an ambitious stance on the reduction of emissions from maritime transport. 
Since the launch of the because of the of because the Ocean Initiative at COP21 in Paris in 2015, in total over 39 countries have taken part in the work of the because of the Ocean as Initiative. Since COP21, considerable progress has been achieved to address the linkage between climate and ocean change, especially thanks to the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere originally proposed by Monaco and supported by the Because the Ocean initiative from COP21 onward. Key pledges contained in the Because the Ocean declaration of 2015 and 2016 have been achieved. Within the framework of the global climate action agenda, France, as a country is very much involved in seven coalitions of stakeholders working at a local level on ocean related actions. It supports the ocean and climate platform and it works in terms of, um, of engagement, knowledge sharing and advocacy in favor, favor of a better incorporation of oceans into national and international climate policies. My friend and the great biologist and scientific head of the Ocean and Climate Platform, Francoise Gale, will tell you more and better than me in a few minutes about this issue. Accelerated ocean warming and acidification are also endangering ecosystems, leading to an extremely high loss of ocean biodiversity. In this country, France promotes the use of nature-based solutions, which are, which are solutions that are both effective in combating climate change and biodiversity erosion. These solutions are numerous and well adapted to the challenges faced by oceans. For example, France is now financing the planting of mangroves in the Philippines, which mitigate coastal risk, storm, flooding, erosion, and serve as an habitat for many species and store CO2. France is definitely and fully committed to this issue, is currently the vice chair of the platform on disaster displacement, PDD, which is chaired by Fiji. This is a grouping of states committing to supporting the protection of displaced people in the context of disasters and climate change, and it sits at the crossroads of several international frameworks, the International Organization for Migration, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate, and also the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. So in brief, one can see that the governments are fully aware of the urgent need to tackle the issues of climate change and protection of the oceans. Whether they will succeed in uh, their attempts is also depending on political choices, clearly, and on support from the civil society. Your festival of ideas today in New York is a proof of a new and a very intense mobilization on this issue. Thank you so much for your attention. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very, very much indeed for opening today's session as part of the York Festival Ideas. We're extremely grateful that uh, you made time to speak to us today. I know you have an extremely busy agenda, but I think you've uh, what you've said so far has, uh, well, really set out some questions. I know questions have come in already as a result of what you've said, but we know you have to leave us now. There are treaties to be signed. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Merci bien. Thank you. Au revoir. Thank you. Now let's introduce our next two speakers. Dr. Bryce Stewart is a senior lecturer in the Department of Environment and Geography at the University of York. A marine ecologist and fisheries biologist, his work on deep sea fishes uh, was amongst the first to demonstrate their extreme longevity. And more recently, his focus has been on improving the management of fisheries using predictive recruitment models, marine protected areas and stock enhancement. 
Bryce is actively promoting sustainability within the seafood industry by working with everyone from government ministers to fishermen to restaurants and to supermarket chains. And uh, our other next speaker is Chris Bowler, who is the CNRS Director of Research at the Institut de Biologie de l'École Normale Supérieure in Paris and a visiting professor at the Collège de France. He is a scientific coordinator of the Tara Oceans Expedition, performing a worldwide analysis of plankton in the global ocean using high throughput DNA sequencing and cellular imaging. You can ask him questions about that and not me. At the Radcliffe Institute, Chris is exploring the ancient DNA from diatoms in sediments accumulated over the millennia on the seafloor and helping to understand how these diatoms will be affected by climate change in the future. It is my pleasure to welcome Bryce to the screen. Over to you. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction, Jonathan. And of course, thank you to the ambassador for that wonderful uh, uh, opening to this event this afternoon. So I have a little presentation, which I will just share with you all now. Okay, so uh, as Jonathan mentioned, I'm from the University of York, from the Environment and Geography Department. Um, happy to take any emails after the event, and you can also follow me on Twitter as well at BD Stew. So why should we care about the ocean? I think we've already heard this from the ambassador, but you know it's important to remember how vast it is. The ocean covers about 70% of the world's surface, but actually in terms of habitable space, it, it makes up about 90% in total. And it acts like a giant sponge and effectively regulates our climate. It absorbs about 90% of the excess heat in our atmosphere. And so without the ocean, we would basically fry. It's estimated that the temperature of the planet would be on average more than 70 degrees Celsius. So given it's about 25 today here in York and we're already feeling a bit warm, I think that would be a little bit too much for some of us. It also absorbs about 30% of the anthropogenic carbon dioxide every year as well. So in many ways, it's helping mitigate the effects of climate change, um, but also, as the ambassador said, it's a victim as well. That increased acidity, that change in pH, and that extra heat is actually having a lot of negative effects on the climate. And this is not just in far-flung places. In fact, the North Sea, which obviously separates the UK and France, um, is one of the uh, climate change hotspots. It's warming up faster than almost anywhere else in the world. But in the ocean, there are, is this thing called blue carbon. This is the catchphrase now that has been adopted quite widely. And this refers to any sort of habitat or environment or species that absorbs carbon. Um, and what I call the big three are seagrass, mangroves and salt marsh. These species, these environments are generally stretching around uh, the coastlines and fairly or obviously intertidal or shallow waters. They only at the moment cover about 1% of all of marine habitats, but they're thought to actually store about 50% of all the buried carbon in marine sediments. So they're incredibly important. But at the same time, unfortunately, they're very threatened. So for example, in the UK, we've lost about 90% of our seagrass over the last couple of centuries. So just to highlight, for example, how important they are, I'm just showing you this infographic. Um, you know, one hectare of uh, seagrass, for example, can store twice as much carbon as a terrestrial forest. In fact, that, you know, that's an, a conservative estimate. Some people have much, much higher figures than that. And of course, these environments are also fantastically important for um, biodiversity, for coastal protection and for the other ecosystem services like tourism, bird watching, etc. that really offer a lot to humanity. What about the rest of the seabed? So I said that this only makes up a small proportion of uh, what's going on in the planet. Um, some of you may have seen this recent study. It came out in March this year that said bottom trawling, fishing uh, gear towed along the seabed re releases as much carbon as air travel. So that's about 2% of all the global emissions every year. And that sounds quite frightening. What is, 
I guess, still to be uh, really nailed down is how does that affect the climate? Does that carbon actually just settle and be reabsorbed by the by the seabed? Does it take much longer? Does some of it get into the atmosphere? Does it change the pH? These are all things that we need to address and keep working on. But the fact that trawling is causing this much disturbance of buried carbon is certainly a concern. And one of the ways to protect and restore these um, critical but also often endangered habitats is to set up marine protected areas. And I'm just going to highlight one that I've been involved with uh, actually for about the last 15 years now. And this is on the Isle of Arran off the west coast of Scotland. This was the first no take zone, so no fishing zone in Scotland, still the only one. And it was the brainchild of Howard Wood and Don McNeish, who were local residents on this island. They campaigned for 13 years with the support of their community and what was known as the Community of Aran Seabed Trust and finally had this passed. Then in 2016, a new much larger marine protected area was uh, implemented right around the south of the island. So this is what it looks like. The total area here is about 250 kilometers squared. The red zone here is the original no take zone. The blue areas are areas of either seagrass or merle, which is a type of uh, sort of calcium based marine algae, which is also very effective at absorbing carbon. And they, those areas have high levels of protection. Scallop dredging is banned completely in this area, but trawling is still allowed in these green areas here. Now, we initially sort of supported this campaign and then have been running the monitoring program for the last 10 years, primarily focused on the biodiversity benefits. And we've done, you know, lots of underwater surveys and boat based surveys. And we've documented the recovery of the seabed, the biodiversity, the increase in the scallops and the lobsters and things like this. And this in itself was, you know, a real success story especially because this whole designation was really driven from the bottom up by the local community. But more recently, we've realized the climate change benefits of this. In fact, the South Aran Marine Protected Area contains over 8,000 tons of carbon per square kilometer. And a lot of the area um, in, in that MPA is buried, uh, sorry, burrowed mud. And that's a particularly important habitat for storing carbon. So it just goes to show how important these sorts of marine protected areas are for delivering these multiple benefits. Now, the UK on paper looks really good now in terms of marine protected areas. This is the network. There's lots of different colors, meaning different things, different designations. But when you look at the detail, even though in total, this covers about 38% of the, the UK EEZ, over 330,000 square kilometers. There are still only four of these fully protected areas covering 21 kilometers squared or 0.0024% of UK seas. So lots of good stuff on paper, but in reality, not nearly so much protection. There is quite a bit more protected from trawling. I think it's about 14,000 kilometers squared now, but that is still a very small percentage um, in, in comparison to the total. So there's still plenty of work to do if we're to take these issues seriously and really make a difference to climate change through protecting the ocean. It's estimated that these ocean-based solutions to climate change can absorb uh, up to 20% of the excess carbon that's being pumped into the uh, atmosphere every year. So climate change in the ocean then, it's important to recognize that the ocean is probably our biggest ally in fighting climate change, but it's also a victim as the ambassador said. So we really need to redouble our efforts, particularly focused on protecting and restoring these, these big three, mangrove, seagrass and uh, salt marsh. We need desperately to do more research into the effects of trawling to work out how to manage that activity better um, and recognize that this sort of protection will bring multiple benefits to both natural world and humanity. So I'll leave you with that and the philosophy of a Coquille Saint-Jacques and I uh, hope you all enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much. Handing you over now to Professor Chris Bowler. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, 
Thank you for joining and thank you to the organizers of this event. Uh, it's great to have this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, briefly, uh, um, I'm going to talk to you about ocean biodiversity and its links with climate. And as we've heard already, um, the ocean is extremely important in the regulation of our climate. Um, a lot of what the ocean does um, is through the absorption of heat and absorption of carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere. Now, these activities uh, can take place without any life in the ocean, right? It's just physics and chemistry that brings the heat and the carbon dioxide into the ocean. Um, and yet the life in the ocean is also extremely important in um, uh, climate regulation. And I want to try and quickly explain to you the role of, uh, of, of life in the ocean. Uh, how it contributes to climate uh, regulation. Um, so, first of all, uh, let's ask, you know, where is the life? Uh, where is the life in the ocean? Where is the biodiversity? Um, Bryce gave you some really nice examples of biodiversity in the ocean, uh, but they're not really relevant to the open ocean where land, where there's no land, there are no islands. Um, so if you think about, you know, the open ocean, um, you don't really see much life in the open ocean um, compared to, you know, if you go for a walk in a forest, the biodiversity is all around you, right? Um, so in the, in the ocean, um, you may think that there's not much biodiversity um, beyond coastal regions. Um, but in fact, these regions are really teeming with life. Um, they just happen to be microscopic. You need a microscope to see these organisms. Um, when you look at these organisms in a microscope, you see that they're incredibly diverse, incredibly uh, uh, morphologically interesting to look at. And as I'll show you, have all kinds of activities. Um, evolutionarily, they also span the whole of the tree of life um, that is currently being mapped. Um, there's an incredible diversity of life in these uh, microscopic component in these microscopic communities, um, which also contributes to this rich biodiversity that is present in in these uh, in these environments. Um, so we call these organisms the plankton, uh, microscopic organisms that drift with the current. Um, we can also think of these organisms as the microbiome of the ocean, sort of the equivalent to the human microbiome in being essential for, for health. Um, so we can consider the plankton as being the invisible multitude um, in terms of biodiversity. Uh, the great majority of biodiversity is present in this microscopic um, uh, world. And also in terms of biomass, if we take all of the, all of the life in the ocean and measure how much carbon is present in different forms of life, uh, we see that the, the planktonic microscopic organisms actually represent about two-thirds of the biomass uh, that is found in the ocean. So they're incredibly important in terms of biodiversity and also in terms of abundance. Um, and they have lots of multiple functions. Um, on the one hand, they're the base of pretty much all oceanic food webs. So the higher organisms eat plankton. So very simply, if there's no plankton, there's no fish, there's no higher organisms in, in the ocean. So they're incredibly important to provide food for the food chain. Um, and then they're also very important in terms of climate regulation um, and as being sensitive to, to climate change, as I'll explain to you in the next couple of slides. Um, so first of all, um, let me, let me um, uh, just bring home the fact that um, this microbial planktonic world of the, of the ocean is also incredibly important because of photosynthesis. Um, so photosynthesis on land is performed by plants and trees, of course. In the ocean, these microscopic organisms are the guys that perform photosynthesis. And by observing our planet from space, and looking particularly at the amount of chlorophyll that is present on the surface of our planet, we have now uh, come to the appreciation that the oceans provide 50% of photosynthesis that happens on our planet. So these organisms then are incredibly important for generating the oxygen that we breathe. Um, and also through photosynthesis, they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it inside the ocean. So this is one way that, um, that plankton regulates the climate by, by uh, regulating the amount of carbon dioxide uh, uh, in, the, in the atmosphere. 
Now, the other side of photosynthesis um, and carbon capture in the ocean um, is carbon export. This is another part of what we know as the, the biological carbon pump in the ocean. So photosynthesis brings carbon dioxide into the ocean and produces organic carbon through the activity of these photosynthetic mi microorganisms. And then when these organisms die, some of them will sink to the bottom of the ocean. And a very small amount of that carbon that they have captured will make it all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. And over very, very long periods of time, geological time periods of time, they will generate the oil and the gas. Um, oil and gas, uh, um, uh, fossil fuels that we're so eagerly burning today, um, unfortunately. So this is the way that plankton contribute to bringing carbon into the ocean and assuring that the carbon makes it down to the bottom of the ocean so it can be sequestered out of the atmosphere for long periods of time and thus helping to, uh, to reduce the impact of carbon dioxide as the greenhouse gas. Uh, uh, in, in the atmosphere, which we're, which we're all, all aware of. So this sort of shows how plankton participates in climate regulation. Um, but in addition to this, plankton are also very sensitive to climate change. Uh, plankton are also a victim of climate change. Um, we have heard about, perhaps you have heard about uh, migrations of fish, um, uh, fishermen having to Go, uh, uh, go further away to, to get their fish catch. Um, that is by and large because the plankton are migrating. The plankton are moving towards poles, uh, trying to maintain, you know, to live in an area where they, they're adapted um, to their temperatures. So as the plankton move, the fish have to move uh, because, the, because the fish eat the plankton, as I, as I have explained. So this is one impact of climate change on plankton. But perhaps a more uh, a direct relationship between um, uh, 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 climate change and plankton. Um, I want to address, I want to show you through the impact of acidification of the ocean um, in, this brief, in this brief story here. So we are very much aware of acidification of the ocean. This is because carbon dioxide is entering into the ocean from the atmosphere. So more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere brings more carbon dioxide into the ocean and carbon dioxide plus water makes bicarbonate, which is acidic. So the oceans are slowly acidifying. We know this is happening. There's not a lot we can do about it. Um, and scientists have been looking at how this impacts ocean life. Um, a, a problem with what we've been able to do uh, in many studies is that we don't have long uh, time periods in which we can study. We don't know what ocean life looked like, you know, before we started pumping these large amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Uh, but one particularly interesting study that I want to point out here is a study that looked at how plankton are perhaps being affected by ocean acidification over the last 150 years. Um, now, this was possible thanks to collections of, of plankton that were generated on the first oceanographic expedition by the HMS Challenger in the 1870s. And comparison of those samples with a more recent expedition, the Tara Oceans Expedition, the largely French expedition that I was involved in, that also collected uh, plankton samples. So what these researchers did, the colleagues of mine from the Natural History Museum in London, actually, they, they looked at the impact of ocean acidification on the, the shells of these tiny microscopic calcifying organisms known as forams, uh, which sort of like shellfish. Uh, they use calcium carbonate to generate the, the, cell, the cell walls around them. You can see the thickness of the cell walls in, uh, on, on the right-hand side in this image in, in blue. And basically, by comparing the thickness of these calcified cell walls um, in forams collected by the HMS Challenger with samples collected today by the Tara Oceans expedition, you can see how the, th the, the thickness of those uh, calcifying shells has really markedly decreased over time. So this is one impact that we see of, uh, of ocean acidification directly on ocean life. So in this brief overview, then, I wanted to try to show you that, that plankton and life in the ocean participates in the regulation of, of our climate and is also a victim of, of climate change. And the bottom line, these are all microscopic, very small organisms. And so the bottom line is, even if you're small, it doesn't mean that you're not important.
um, microbes are incredibly important uh, in our lives, including in uh, regulation, assuring the well-being of our planet. So I will end there. Thank you for your attention. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for what you've had to say to us in the last few minutes. Um, very informative and some of it rather concerning. Um, are there issues that the two of you would like to just discuss briefly with what with one another for a moment or two? I mean, some of the, the figures that Bryce, you came up with, sounded certainly to the layman like myself to be quite alarming. I guess you mean in terms of uh, the loss of those sort of blue carbon habitats? Um, 90%, I think you said at once. Yeah, stage. seagrass, for example. I mean, yeah, that is a tragic loss. And it's very difficult to reverse, but not impossible. And so, you know, we are now um, officially in the, in the UN uh, Ocean Restoration Decade, I believe it, it's called. And so there are some fantastic projects around the world replanting things like seagrass, and mangroves, for example. So seagrass, as the name suggests, are actually a flowering plant that um, exists underwater. And so like all flowering plants, you can harvest the seeds from them and then effectively grow them up to a certain stage in the lab and then, you know, put them back into the, into the ocean. But it is painstaking. It's a bit like replanting a football field one blade of grass at a time. Um, so it's much better for us not to lose these habitats in the first place and it's a, the the damage has been done by a whole combination of things so it's been you know yes it has been fishing to an extent but it's also pollution it's also coastal development which has sort of caused um turbidity in the water that smothered seagrass and so really it's a case of better looking after our marine environment you know across the board is what we need to be doing if we're to um see the best out of these habitats well, as someone who's uh, taking his first ever holiday to the Isle of Arran, not this coming week, but the next week, I'm going to uh, look at the seas with added interest. Enjoy. I, thank you. Can I um, put some questions from our audience today to uh, to both of you? Um, and, and please pick up on this if you wish. Joe says, uh, we keep hearing about tipping points in terms of climate crisis. Have we reached them or do we really have a way to rebalance? Maybe, Chris, you've got some thoughts on this. Yeah, perhaps I can start. Um, I mean, um, uh, we are learning more and more about tipping points in the ocean. Um, I, I don't think we have a real clear handling of, of when you're going to hit a tipping point and when the system pivots from one system to another. Uh, through our research, uh, we are learning more and more about those tipping points. And um, we're learning, for example, um, uh, from, from the past, from how the ocean has changed in the past, um, over glacial cycles, over millions of years uh, uh, back into the past. We're learning about how the ocean has been impacted by um, climate changes in the past. Uh, this is helping us to understand, you know, when are these tipping points? Uh, precisely, uh, when do they kick in? Um, and we are we are we are learning as we go along um, in terms of getting more and more precise ideas about when these tipping points come in. It's more and more that we learn about things. We see that yes, there are gradual changes that happen, and then a sort of threshold is reached, and then the system changes, basculates over into another system. So. So the Earth system does seem to work in terms of tipping points, um, and tipping points, of course, impact um, uh, biology as well, impact uh, life, including in the ocean. So this is something that, that scientists are actively working on um, and um, slowly will understand better how it works. Bryce, um, can I put this question to you, please? This is from Rosie, who just asked the very stark question, what can we, as the general public, actually do to help? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, we can all do things to reduce, uh, you know, our uh, effects on climate change. And this starts at the home, obviously, you know, sort of rethinking the way that we treat waste, um, you know, being more energy efficient in terms of both the way we heat and cool our homes. Things like better insulation in your house are one of the best things you can do, for example, Obviously, rethinking your travel, you know, using uh, public transport, for example, where it's viable. 
but beyond that, um, you can, you, you know, you can obviously choose food in whatever form uh, from more uh, sustainable sources. So obviously local food is generally better in terms of carbon footprint. Um, but of course, don't forget politicians and, you know, keep lobbying them either yourself individually or through organizations in the UK, for example, the Marine Conservation Society are a great organization to support in that regard. Okay. Um, well, thank you for that. I'll just uh, draw everyone's attention to what Sir David Attenborough is uh, saying today to the G7 leaders meeting at Carbis Bay. He says, we know in detail what's happening to our planet and we know all of the things we need to do during the decade. Tackling climate change is now as much a political and communications challenge as it is a scientific or technological one. We have the skills to address it in time. All we need is the global will to do so, which I think harks back to what the ambassador was saying when he started us off this afternoon. Um, John and Margaret Vernon have this question. Could Bryce please explain a, in a bit more detail why trawling, disturbs, uh, trawling the seabed releases so much CO2? Yeah, so basically, if you think about the, the plankton that Chris was talking about and how that's absorbing carbon, and when that dies, it sinks to the seabed. So this is one of the main sources. And then it's locked away, just like you get carbon locked away in soil in your garden, basically. Now, that is fine unless it's not disturbed by anything. And there is a certain amount of disturbance from things like waves and currents and things like that. But if you're trawling the seabed, um, and therefore disturbing it. Things like scallop dredges, for example, are, are like rakes across the seabed. And so they're stirring that up and that carbon is then released into the water. Now, trawling occurs over a huge area, particularly in coastal seas around the world, um, but it is also important. It provides about 25% of seafood. So we've got to strike the balance between food production and impacts on the environment and climate. And I think the best way to do that is to keep working on ways of fishing that have a lower impact, but also um, protect those most sort of sensitive, but also uh, most effective habitats for storing away carbon and supporting biodiversity. Okay, question to, to both of you. This is from uh, SK, who says, my 13-year-old would like to know how to become a marine biologist. Do a job like Bryce so he can help to save the oceans? Um, is the starting point a biology degree? Biology degree would help, yes. Environmental sciences in, in general, yeah. Um, first thing you need is passion, passion for the job, uh, because you work long hours and you don't get paid very well. So <laughs> first of all, you need passion. And when you've got passion, then uh, then you can get to the uh, to the ultimate aim of being a marine biologist through a degree in biology or physics, chemistry, environmental sciences. You know, there's a lot of avenues into uh, being a marine biologist at the end of the day. Gentlemen, thank you both very much indeed. I'm sure you're going to stay with us and maybe come in and uh, join more questions from our audience and give more answers towards the, the end of our session. But I think at this point, we should welcome our final speaker today, who is Francoise Gale. Francoise is a biologist focusing on marine biodiversity research. She has been in charge of research and innovation at the Renel de la Mer and was president of the Scientific and Strategic Committee of the large-scale infrastructure French Oceanographic Fleet. Francoise was vice president of the Alliance à l'Envie, uh, a national environmental research consortium, and is now scientific advisor for the National Centre for Scientific Research, the Institute of Ecology and the Environment. She's also chair of the National Committee for Marine and Coastal Research and is vice chair of the French delegation of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Committee of UNESCO. Francoise is vice chair of the French Agency for Biodiversity, chair of the Scientific Council of the Fondation de la Mer, and has represented France in several United Nations negotiations, such as the World Ocean Assessment, UN reports on the Sustainable Development Goals, especially Goal 14, which is dedicated to the oceans. Having said all that, you'll appreciate what a tremendous uh, favour she's doing us by making time to talk at the York Festival of Ideas this afternoon. Francoise, over to you. Thank you for introducing my talk. 
And I would like also to thank the French embassy in UK, my close friend Mina, and the York Festival for organizing this event on the road to COP26. As it was said, I am originally a deep sea biologist and becoming a research director emeritus. I had the conviction that it was necessary to promote the ocean research in international fora and in particular those of the United Nations. And we were some friends at the origin of the Ocean and Climate Platform in 2014. So what is this platform? This answer lies in the name. The OCP is an NGO which focuses its work on the message, a healthy ocean, a protected climate. It was created the, on the June 8th at the UNESCO in 2014 on the occasion of uh, the World Ocean Day. And the aim of this uh, collaborative endeavor was uh, to integrate the ocean into climate discussions, and especially in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the so-called uh, CNU, uh, the CNUC. So the ocean plays a crucial role in climate change. It has been said uh, previously by uh, both uh, the scientists, uh, it's absorbed one third of the anthropogenic CO2 and more than 90% of the excess heat produced by human activity. And in this way, the ocean regulates the climate system and provides essential services to sustain and develop life on Earth, as well to human societies. So who are the members of the platform? The platform coalition regroups all types of ocean actors. We are today about 100 OCP members, including the NGOs, private foundations, such as the Tariff Oceans, of which you have heard by, for, from Chris Boller, aquariums, museum, research institutions, cities, public stakeholders, private companies, and international authorities. One third of our members are from international organizations, and we are firmly supported by the IOC UNESCO. Our mission is to raise awareness among policymakers and civil society of the links between the ocean, climate, and biodiversity. We also provide new knowledge and insights into the issues, challenges, and solutions at the interfaces between biodiversity, ocean, and climate. We mostly do this through civil society mobilization. We also synthesize and disseminate scientific knowledge via the publication of scientific sheets, infographics, and educational information. And finally, our action is advocacy and international cooperation through the production of policy recommendations and organizing or participating in international conference. And we are closely associated with the Because the Ocean Initiative mentioned by the ambassador, initiated by the Prince of Monaco. So we are a small organization, but the work of the scientific committee, of the expert committee, and of different working groups has led to compelling victories. The first one is the inclusion of the ocean in the preamble of the Paris Agreement, then in the global action agenda at COP22, and in the launch of the Ocean Pathway Partnership at COP23, and finally at COP25, 20 recommendations from the OCP were presented and we were identified to participate to the CEPSTA, which is the forum where scientific reports are discussed in the CNU C. At least we are now co-chairing the Nairobi program uh, working group on adaptation to climate change. And also, we are currently playing a major role in the organization of the COP26 in Glasgow for the civil society. In addition, we have played an important role for convincing the IPCC to produce a special report on ocean and climate, resulting to the SROC, 
the first report dedicated to the ocean and cryosphere published in September 2019. The government of France has mandated the platform to review the IPCC 1.4 degrees C and ocean and cryosphere report, as well as the sixth assessment report scheduled for publication in 2022. So what kind of reports we have published recently? Our latest policy brief is called Swimming the Talk, how to strengthen synergies between the climate and biodiversity convention. We are in an exceptional year where three events are being held, COP26 on the climate, COP15 on biodiversity, and the year of the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. This policy brief explores options to build synergy between the CBD and the UNFCCC toward a more integrated ocean climate biodiversity governance. Diving into these conventions, this brief identifies four possible entry points across science, policy, action, and finance to start swimming the talk and boost cooperation to address the greatest challenges of our time. Last but not least, we have produced a new report called Ocean of Solutions to Tackle Climate Change and Biodiversity Loss. And this report wishes to bring that albeit the ocean is strongly affected by human activity, it is also a source of many solutions to meet environmental and socio-economical challenges. The Ocean and Solution Report collates a number of nature-based solutions resulting from the expertise of 60 members of the platform. And it is an example of knowledge sharing as it brings together scientists, public institutions, local authorities, civil society, and the private sector. This report paved the way for action, shedding light on how to move from the problem to the solution by providing solutions organized around four mine access, the protection and restoration of coastal and marine ecosystem, the promotion of scientific research for innovation, the transition to low carbon society territories and economies, and this report also proposed initiative to raise awareness and mobilize citizens, ensuring the necessary level of awareness to shift from knowledge to action. Therefore, we provide concrete solutions to meet international engagements. And this report brings together accessible, replicable, scalable, and efficient initiatives to encourage transformative changes therefore reconciling the protection of biosphere with societal challenges. So the platform has moved from an initial focus on ocean and climate to ocean, climate, and biodiversity, and is now moving to illustrate the way to sharing solutions. It is very much the goal of the project Cities which aims to facilitate the development of public policies and the implementation of adaptation solutions for coastal cities threatened by rising sea levels. We are co-constructing an international network based on four geographic areas, the north of Europe, the Med Sea associating the west of Africa, the Pacific Islands, and the west part of the United States, the California state. And the results, of this section will be presented at the next COP26 in Glasgow. So see you in Glasgow next time, and thank you for your attention. François, thank you very, very much indeed for uh, outlining the work that you're doing. Um, please, uh, if you're attending the meeting and you would like to put a question to François, now is the time to do it using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. François, can I ask you, how easy is it for scientists like yourself, people who, like the scientists we've heard this afternoon, who are working out what we do and what we don't need to do to our oceans, how difficult or easy is it for you to convince politicians that they have got to go back to their fishermen, the people who are exploring for oil, the people who live in coastal communities, that there are certain things that they must and must not do 
because politicians like to be popular and saying you must do this or you mustn't do that is really quite difficult. Yes, I agree with you. But um, Chris was uh, telling uh, we have to to have a patient to be a researcher or scientist. And I think that this patient can be also oriented uh, about the uh, objective from science to policy. And then uh, at the end of your lifetime, uh, when you are no more, more primary producer in research, you may, I think, be interested to use this knowledge that you have acquired to uh, act with the policy makers to work with them and to, I think, explain very simply what are the challenges and why it's so important to work on ocean and climate. And for example, I think that um, the fact that you are more um, delivered from the pressure of uh, publishi publishing reports and so on. Uh, the discovery for me of the civil society was very, very important. I was a very deep academic person at the beginning. And then now I can understand why the civil society is so important. And the network we are trying to organize and to uh, work with uh, at the international level is um, uh, and rich because um, even is the DNA of the platform is the scientist uh, field. Uh, we have a lot of people uh, who are able to uh, convince their neighbor that we have to, to work with the ministry. And I think also that uh, it's not the Ministry of Research which is the most uh, important uh, aspect in this uh, fight. It is um, the Ministry of Environment, uh, the Ministry of the Sea. And uh, in this way, you may have collaborative uh, work with uh, the state. Thank you for that. Can I ask you a question that's been submitted by an anonymous attendee at the meeting today? Um, what can and, and maybe Bryce and Chris would like to, to join with uh, some thoughts on this because it's a very broad question. What can scientists and policymakers do to counter the still significant influence of some social media platforms who refuse to see how much of a problem climate change is? Francoise, do you? I mean. We see it every day. There is climate change denial in spite of the fact that climate change amongst responsible scientists is a given, is a fact. I think it's not uh, the reality. I think that the newspaper and the media as, uh, are um, uh, showing this type of position. But uh, uh, in the reality, I, I think that we, we have moved from a, a sceptical position in the society about climate change to now something which is more positive and uh, the recognition of uh, the climate change is now, for me, it's uh, uh, obvious. Bryce, um, I mean, I, I present a daily phone-in programme on BBC Radio York. If I were to say, um, which I won't, I won't, because actually the BBC has developed its own rules on the subject of climate change, for, for example, that there is now sufficient scientific weight of opinion in the world that climate change is a thing, and it's it would be foolish to question it. However, there are still people who do. Is that position going to change? And how much do some of those influential voices who doubt climate change or outright deny it, how much damage do they do to the work that you and others are doing? Yeah, I mean, they certainly do do damage. Um, but I think the question, will it change, you can answer by looking at how uh, climate change is much more widely accepted now than what it was, say, 10 or 20 years ago. And one of the reasons for that is, you know, all the tremendous science that's been going on, but also the science communication work as well. And people, uh, you know, are learning new and different ways to build in messages about climate change you know and that is 
you know, somebody like me writing a scientific paper is not going to reach your the people calling into your programs. But if somebody makes a, you know, a film on Netflix or, you know, does a piece of art or whatever it is, something quite creative that can reach new audiences. But we have to be really careful to stick to the facts and be clear what we do and don't know and sort of weigh things up. And I think that, you know, the the consensus now is that we really do need to take action. We don't know everything about climate change, but we know there's a big problem. And we know that if we act now, we can make a big difference. And so that's the message that we've just got to keep trying to get out there in different and new ways and reaching new audiences. And, and we'll get there in the end. Um, Chris, maybe you've got some thoughts on that. Or maybe I could just ask you a very... Um direct question about something marine that has entered the news in the last few days and that is something that goes by the unfortunate title of sea snot um i understand marine mucilage is the uh, the correct way of referring to it off turkey in the sea of marmara um is that related to the subject that we're talking about today the health of the oceans is that some kind of indicator albeit on a relatively small scale globally that things are going wrong yeah, it certainly is uh, in, indicative. It's diagnostic of, uh, of the fact that the the oceans are sick, um, and in that case, it's a result of you know environmental degradation. Um, it's not necessarily a result of um, climate change um, caused by human activities, but it's certainly a result of environmental degradation caused by human activities. Um, um, so in that case, in terms of like agriculture uh, runoff, um, bringing fertilizers into the into the Sea of Marmara uh, down there has, has brought in a lot of nutrients and provoked a lot of uh, stimulated a lot of algal growth, which then turns the, uh, the 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 ocean upside down. It's sort of like that's a tipping point that we that we have seen an example of. Um, that was the question was asked earlier. Uh, some sort of tipping point was reached where the amount of agricultural runoff and human chemicals, whatever, was such that uh, that the that the that the that the ecosystem just 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 uh, lost its equilibrium, went out of control, and some organisms that produce this snot, this mucilage, in very high amounts, just took over the ecosystem. Um, and, um, yeah, it's very damaging. It's very, uh, ugly to see and, um, it will slowly clear itself up, I suppose, within, um, uh, a few months or a year or so. But this is, you know, just a, a an indicator of the, the extent to which we, we can damage our environment. Um, Francoise, can I, can I bring you back in at this point? Is this an indication of the kind of work? that the, the COP25, 26 conferences have to address where national governments have got the difficult job of going back, say, to the farmers of Turkey and saying, we know that you're struggling to grow crops on land that maybe isn't as fertile as you would like, but you've got to stop using the kind of fertilisers that will leach into the sea and cause this kind of damage. It's a really difficult message. Yes, I think that... Uh... The COP26 perhaps uh, will uh, look at this as uh, an example of all the damage that uh, human actions may have on, on the ocean. But uh, you know, there is a national uh, determined contribution, the NDC, we said, where each country may uh, deliver. Uh, the proposition for the next uh, um, five years of action that the state will have. And in this respect, I think that there will be uh, different negotiation about that. Because one of the uh, actual question open is the relationship between uh, the climate change and biodiversity. And in this respect, there is two cup and both uh, have to work together. And it was um, uh, the, the, this week, I think, IPCC and, uh, IPB, and IPBS were publishing a common uh, report uh, identifying a different uh, aspect of what has to be done in the future. And this type of question 
is included in their report also. Right, a question from Sophia Brown. Uh, this is a difficult one, I think. How would you define sustainability? Um, is there any truly sustainable process? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Um, I mean, there are official uh, definitions of sustainability out there. Forgive me if I don't get the words um, completely right, but but basically you're maintaining, a, say, a resource or a population at a level which will continue indefinitely. So you're using that or keeping it at a level which will allow you to meet your needs without damaging the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So in terms of, you know, in my field, I mostly work on fisheries and fish stocks. Um, we often focus on what's called maximum sustainable yield or maximum economic yield. Now, interestingly, that means that you're not keeping the populations at the level that they would be if there was, say, no fishing, because everything we do as a human race you know, every activity, every generation of food has an impact on the environment. So you are reducing it to a certain extent, but you're keeping it at a level which doesn't maintain its long-term future. So I kind of compare it to like money in the bank. You know, you want to live off the interest, not off the capital, basically. And that's really what we're trying to do. Like natural ecosystems are, are sustainable. Um you know, a forest ecosystem, a field ecosystem tends to be sustainable. Um, everything is equilibrated. There is no particular uh, species that, that outcompetes the other. You know, there is an equilibrium in that natural ecosystem because it's sustainable. And um, I think we have to try to sort of get inspiration from natural ecosystems to learn how natural ecosystems manage to be sustainable um, and, and try to, you know, uh, figure out how to do this ourselves in our own society. Um, a question from Min Ha Pham, uh, who says, thank you, Francoise, and to all the speakers in the name of the French Embassy. Uh, a question, what do you expect most from COP26 on the concrete side of protecting the ocean and the climate? Maybe concrete is not a a good word to mix in with uh, protecting the oceans here, but I know exactly what uh, our questioner means. What concrete are you hoping, what practical is going to emerge in November in Scotland? Uh, for me, uh, there is one point which is very important. I was uh, discussing of that previously. It's a national determined contribution. So each country will have to explain to expose why they are trying to take care of all the part of uh, their action uh, to relative to climate. But uh, when you look at the way we are trying to analyze the different uh, published uh, NDCs at this time, and we are quite astonished by the fact that uh, since the last time, um, the seeds, the small islands uh, uh, development state, uh, are the countries which are taking care of ocean and they propose concrete action about mangroves, about um, uh, carbon storage, about uh, resilience of their ecosystem, marine ecosystem and so on, uh, indicating that they are taking care of ocean. But Europe, for example, uh, when you look at the indices of Europe, they are not integrating anything about marine aspect. So it is very, for us, we are uh, trying to look at the discussion that the different states will have around the importance of the ocean in the negotiation. It's, it's a very big point because uh, there is um, a difficulty the state are uh, considering that uh, the territories have emerged are from the earth, but uh, they have a part of the ocean, which is part of the national territories, the economical exclusive zone. But outside there, uh, this zone, they consider that they are not 
uh, responsible for the open ocean. And the question for us is when you look, and it was said by uh, Chris and others, uh, the, the ocean is so big that uh, usually uh, it's not, uh, think, like part of our territories. And it's true because, well, we, there is a negotiation which is BBNG taking care of which type of governance may we create to uh, conserve and to sustainable uh, uh, preserve the high seas, the, the part of the ocean which is not covered by the economic exclusive zone. So we are really um, interested by this COP26 to see which type of evolution uh, we will have about uh, climate change uh, for the ocean uh, impact and actions. Many nations are currently piling into the Arctic zone. I think there is a, a huge fight on the way between uh, quite a number of nations over uh, ex the exploitation of natural resources, gas, oil, and uh, maybe other things like minerals as well. Um, Bryce, for someone like yourself, how concerning is is it to see that that kind of um, conflict really is up and coming? Yeah, I think that is really quite concerning. I mean, we hear that, you know, I think it's something like 20% of the untapped uh, oil and natural gas reserves are in the Arctic. And ironically, they're becoming more available because of climate change, because the ice is melting. Um, Aside from the input of extra carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, I always think back to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and think about the fact that it took months to, to tap that, to stop it. Now, imagine if a disaster like that happened somewhere in the Arctic where, you know, it's dark for six months of the year, where the, the weather conditions are horrendous, where, you know, it's freezing cold. I mean, we would just not be able to stop a spill like that in what is a relatively pristine area that would go on possibly for years. And so for me, that should be a complete no-go no, no -go zone, really, in terms of oil and gas exploration. We should be putting our efforts into alternative energy sources now and, and you know, not be digging up more, basically, extracting more, but um, and, and spreading those risks, but you know, looking much more towards the future. Thank, thank you for that. Um, I'll just remind uh, those attending that our session is due to end in about 10 minutes time. So this is your last call for questions. Please do use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen if you have more questions to ask. Um, Chris, a bit of an echo really to what we're just uh, hearing from, from Bryce there. Um, we have all these, um, these meetings, these high level meetings like the one taking place in Scotland in November. Um, an anonymous question here a lot of promises are made do you really believe that we can hold these politicians to account when it comes to the promises made and the actual outcome uh, I mean, we have to keep trying uh, we have to be optimistic um, um, there are uh, you know, success stories we've had in the past um, that make us, uh, that give us optimism and make us believe that it's worth, you know, keeping the pressure on to, uh, to solve the current issues. Um, if we take the example of the Montreal Protocol that dealt with the, uh, the CFCs um, in refrigerants um, that were destroying the ozone, uh, the ozone hole, the ozone in the, in the upper atmosphere in the uh, 1980s, I believe, um, through the Montreal Protocol, um, governments got together and phased out these, uh, these nasty chemicals, the CFCs, and replaced them with, uh, with others. And so we, we did it. We, um, um, we, we, we managed to deal with this problem. The ozone hole is, is closing, or perhaps it's completely closed. I don't, I'm not sure. But so that shows that we can we can do it. We can get together as a as a planet and deal with you know major environmental issues. Um, the the problem you know the Montreal Protocol um, example was a fairly easy problem to solve because um, because there were alternatives to these refrigerants to these chemicals that we used in our refrigerators. There were alternatives already ready to go. So 
we just had to replace them. Here we are. The, the problem with climate change today is that it's all related to the petrochemical industry. And we are, as a society, we are heavily addicted to petrochemicals. Um, you know, try and live a day without plastics. Try and live a day without um, uh, any petrochemicals. It's it's incredibly difficult. Well, um, let, me, let me let me stop you there, if, if I may be so rude, because two questions have come in. One from Dave, um, who asks, "How is microplastic and other pollutants affecting the plankton?" And you spoke extensively about plankton. And Tessa simply says, "Is there a solution to cleaning up microplastics?" We have those astonishing pictures of the wreck. I think it was off the coast of Liberia or somewhere similar not that long ago um, with tons and tons of microplastic. Well, th these weren't even microplastic bees. These were huge plastic bees, bees yeah. that were being shifted around the world to, uh, to, to turn into plastic cups and goodness knows what else. Microplastics, obviously much smaller than that, part of the food chain now in, found in most fish. What yes. on earth do we do about that? Is it too late? to reverse the the level of microplastic pollution that we've poured into the oceans well again we've got to we've got to kick our addiction to to microplastics we've got to get rid of plastics from our society as quickly as we can uh, that you know plastics are are pervasive in our lives you know most of most of our clothes these days have, have plastics in them right the polyesters nylons polyamides, we don't necessarily associate clothes with plastics, but they're everywhere, you know, beyond plastic bags and plastic bottles and, and so on. So we have to kick the habit. Um, we have to do it urgently um, uh, be, because these things hang around in the environment for a, a huge amount of time. Um, I mean, what we have already seen is that, you know, plastics have only really been around since Second World War. Um they only really came into our society in like the 1960s. And then over the last 50 years, we've managed to create this huge amount of plastic garbage, you know, that is now filling our oceans, that is really everywhere, even in, you know, pristine environments like Arctic, Antarctic, you see a lot of plastics down there too. And so we have seen in these last 50 years that some organisms are learning to live on that plastic, in particular, the microbes, different planktonic microbes, they now sit on top of the plastics and they start to decompose the plastic. They start to degrade it. Um, it's a very slow process. Um, still, it's very inefficient. But these microbes within 50, 60 years, they've learned how to do it through evolution. So if scientists can learn more about how microbes do it, then perhaps we can we can use those microbes to help us find solutions to, to break down all the plastic in our environment. It's another example of a, of a nature-based solution. Francoise, um, how easy, excuse me, Francoise, how easy is it going to be to get a message as hard as that one over at COP26 to world governments um, that plastics have to become a thing of the past, that we can't use them as sort of dermabrasion constituents of face cleaners or toothpastes or that I've got to stop wearing my favourite fleece jacket because every time I wash it, tiny particles of plastic are washed off that fleece jacket into the water system and that I'm, you know, I should be wearing something else, something made of cotton, for example. Yes, I think that there is a coalition about plastic. And uh, this coalition is increasing the number of state which are uh, taking care of that. And um, uh, it was starting five years ago and the, the ambassador was telling about the seven uh, uh, coalition we, we are in, uh, associated to. And this uh, plastic question is at the heart of uh, a lot of other uh, questions which are cumulative stressors uh, adding to climate pressure. So I think that uh, during the COP26, um, a type of uh, proposition will be um, uh, seen with uh, this coalition and the different states will try to propose concrete action also for this uh, plastic uh, damage and uh, production. Thank you all very much indeed. Oh, very final brief question, very quickly, from Annie, who says, 
How do you as marine conservationists feel about tidal and wave power generation? What is its impact on biodiversity? I'm not sure whether Bryce or Chris, who feels more more up to date on it, but tidal wave and power generation, is, is that in any way going to affect the oceans? Right. Uh, just oh, sorry. Just quickly for me. I mean, I, I think probably the the pros outweigh the cons. Um, if you're talking about tidal lagoons, that's a little bit different. But in open ocean, uh, these sort of wave driven generators, as far as we know so far, have very little impact on biodiversity. But of course, provide a renewable energy source. So, yeah, I think there's a lot to be done there. Okay, I think that is the point at which we ha will have to wrap up our session today. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Francoise in Paris, Chris in Paris as well, Bryce a little closer to home, I believe, in yep. uh, York. And thank you earlier as well to uh, the uh, the French ambassador for uh, the, the Poles and for uh, the maritime world for, for joining us. Um, You've been absolutely splendid and fielded questions from me and from our audience right, left and centre. Thank you for being part of our audience today, if you've been watching at home. The recording of this event is going to be available on the Festival YouTube channel, which uh, you can access from the Watch Again section of the Festival website after the 20th of June. You'll be contacted by email when the video is available to view. We very much hope that you will continue to be engaged with the York Festival of Ideas, uh, check out the website. It's yorkfestivalideas.com, of course, for full details of all the events in the programme. There are so many. There are even many more today. We'd love you to continue the conversation on uh, Twitter and other social media platforms using the hashtag YorkIdeas. Um, all that remains for me to say is thank you very much indeed for attending. Um, I hope you've enjoyed all the fascinating discussion from our experts who've given their time so freely and so finely today. The score is currently England nil, Croatia nil. So, allez Angleterre, le football. Merci bien. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank Au you. Bye-bye. Thank you.